Hey, hello everyone. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is uh, hangout number 130. And welcome to everybody who's in the chat room. Um, some of you didn't get my link, which I sent it out yesterday and I forgot to send it out during the day today, but I just sent it out like a minute ago again, in case you didn't see the first one and you wanted to come and I want you to show up. There you are. <laughs> Yay. All right. Hi, Sky Ricky. You did make it. Okay. Hailing in wild winds here in Quebec. We have the, ver we just have the boring Maryland version here. It's just rainy and gloomy and coolish and all that kind of stuff. So let me welcome everybody who is here. <laughs> we have Emily, we have Sarah, we have Sky Ricky, we have Clarissa. Who else? Uh, let's see, Linda's here and um, I'm going blind today again. Uh, Lauren is here. <laughs> did I say Clarissa, Melissa and Emily? And Mary and Anne and Marie and Dawn and I think I already said Emily. I'm going back to Melanie and Jill and, and if I'm missing you now, I feel bad about that. But hey, thank you for being here. Um, if you want to be in the chat room, this is this is patron only. Please do click the link below in the description. You can join Patreon. There's eight live shows a month, uh, two every week, uh, one hangout like this, and the case files on the weekend. Um, and you can participate in all those and in the community. It's five bucks a month. It's hardly, well, let's see, it's a Starbucks coffee. And if I were you, I wouldn't drink Starbucks coffee. And the five bucks is better on my channel. <laughs> it keeps me going. Educational channel, that it is. Um, otherwise, if you don't want to join Patreon and you're watching this later on, uh, it's okay. All of my videos are available to the public so everyone can learn criminal profiling and crime scene analysis. Please do hit the subscribe button. Oh, you can hit the like button too for the video, but subscribing is really important to the channel. It makes a difference. And check all of my playlists and uh, see what I've done and see what, you're, you know, what interests you. It might be there. All right. So that's where I'm at. Okay, everyone. Can you all hear and see me properly since... Uh, I just want to double check because I've had some weird technical issues in the last couple of shows. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. So congrats on, oh, well, thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Congrats on the 40K. Yes, that, that is helpful. I really need 100K. I, no, it's, it's, it, um, it's not that I'm greedy. It's that to survive as a channel, you really actually have to get 100K. Um, and I've been here for three years and I've gotten 40,000 and I've seen horrible gossip channels in there on <laughs> They're on 200,000 K in six months. And I'm like, don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. You know, you're doing an educational channel, but yes, 40,000 is, is way better than, um, than what it was before. <laughs> but that's why I do uh, encourage subscribers because it does make a difference in the algorithms and keeps the channel alive. So anyway, but yes, thank you. Oh, you can see and hear me. Okay. I just wanted to check. It's been a weird week. Anyway, all kinds of interesting news and some of the things I want to uh, address that you've all sent to me. But first I want to talk about, um, I just did a video uh, and I put that, the, uh, the link will be below. Um, it was this one, this one here. And I did a video on, I'm not even moving. See, I just look very stiff there. <laughs> but, but I will talk behind this because I want you to hear what this is about. Um, so hold on a second. I'm trying to find, find my names here. Um, we have, um, uh, on the left, we have Rachel Moore and I worked on her case, uh, developing a profile and that profile is on the show. And next to her is Lakin Riley, who was murdered, uh, just recently in, in, in Georgia. Uh, and the, the guy that's next, next in line there is the guy that killed the Rachel Morin and the guy at the end who has a weird bandaid on his head because I clicked the wrong picture. Um, he was the one that killed, oh, he is alleged to have killed um, Lake and Riley, the other girl who was a college student. Okay, now let me explain. Uh, that show is on how you link crimes together uh, because I saw a lot of people jump into conclusions that those, the two women were murdered by the same guy. So when they found this guy, you know, and they, arrested the guy in the uh, um, Lake and Riley murder on the, who lived right next to the University of Georgia in Athens. Um, and he was Hispanic, as was the guy who they think is Hispanic. At least that's what he's supposed to be in the Rachel Moran case. Everybody's like, great, they got the guy. 
And of course, they matched the DNA and found out it didn't match. So I do a whole I did a whole 40 minute show on how to understand crime linkage, because so much stuff is misunderstood about how it's done, how effective it is, what you need to look for with a mo, uh, MO and signature and all these kind of things. So go check that show out. Not now because you're watching this show, <laughs> but the link is going to be below in the description. OK, but I do want to talk about first. I'm going to talk about each one of these cases just in a different way. Um, the guy on the left, Jose Ibarra, is the guy who is has been arrested for the murder of Lake and Riley, the girl in, uh, the, that went jogging on the University of Georgia campus. Um, next to him is Diego Ibarra, who is his who is his brother. Okay, and I saw this interesting commentary on it, and I just it, it like ticked me off a wee bit. Anyway, um, this is what it said here. Let me go down to the spot in the article. Um, it says, last year, Ibarra, that's a Jose guy, the, the alleged murderer, uh, twice slipped through the hands of law enforcement and could have been deported after a bust in the Big Apple. Okay, it's so New York Post, so they're exaggerating. But still, did, did he, the guy, the guy on the left, slip through? the hands of, law, of, of uh, law enforcement, along with his brother, Diego, who is, both of them are illegal immigrants. Um, and uh, Diego is not exactly an honest fellow either. And he's, quote, slipped through uh, law enforcement's fingers. But let me tell you something. Neither one of them slipped through law enforcement. Law enforcement could only follow the rules that were given to them by or, or, or whoever made the rules. Um, you know, laws, as they say, are only as good as the people who enforce them. And if you're not allowed to enforce certain laws or the laws have stipulations, well, then they do what they have to do. So these two guys came through the border at one point. Uh, I think Diego, uh, his brother, has been here quite a while illegally. And uh, I don't guess he didn't show for his hearing. <laughs> you know, but then then uh, Jose showed up, I think, in 2022. And um, he went to the border and claimed, you know, hey, you know, you know, you know, I, 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 I have to leave Venezuela. You know, um, you know, things are bad down there. I, I, you know, my life is in danger. So, yeah. So he he wanted his chance to come to the U.S. And it's always kind of funny because um and, this, you know, when you look at people who are claiming uh, that wherever is happening back home is so bad that they, they must leave their country and come here. Well, you know, uh, you can say that about any place that th things aren't going great in. And uh, as much as I feel sorry for that, there, there is an issue about um can you let everybody in? So I'm not going to get into the argument over that, but I want to point out that when you have a law at the border, which basically is you, 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 they do document that you're here and, and that you're claiming asylum. Um, now my father, by the way, was on the last boat out of uh, Germany uh, when the Nazis took over and he had, his father had to get, a, um, he had to get a letter from somebody in the United States that said he would support my father's family um, when they came over. Otherwise he wasn't gonna get on that boat. He wasn't gonna be allowed into the country. <laughs> now I'm thinking my father was a German Jew. I'm pretty sure that German Jews at the time of <laughs> Hitler were in danger. So he had a good amnesty claim, He, but he had to still get the paperwork. And he was on the last ship out. And the people who didn't get on that ship, some of our, my relatives, ancestor relatives, didn't they died because it wasn't a, a question of we're not making enough money or the gangs in my country it was a question of we we don't we go want to go on a train someplace we don't want to go to <laughs> so and my and my ex-husband is a, a jamaican um and he and his family applied uh, through the immigration system and they worked their butts off for that and they came in legally and they didn't claim that jamaica is a country which is dangerous which it is because mm, you know, people get shot all the time there. And he's had uh, my my some of my um, relatives down there. One was a, one was a police officer. He got he got ambushed and killed. Uh, so hey, not the safest place in the world. And it's it's, it's terrible poverty down there. Um, 
that's why his family wanted to come here. And um, so there's always a reason to want to leave a certain place and come to another certain place. So we have, you know, I'd say it's not a political challenge, but it's pointing out that when people come to a border and they apply for amnesty, a right to come into the country, there are laws and the laws either say we're going to not let you in or we're going to let you in because you have true amnesty or and you have paperwork <laughs> or we're going to let you in and say show up for the hearing, <laughs> in which case everybody just spreads out like running, running, running mice and they don't come back for the hearing. Well, apparently Diego on the right never came back for that hearing and he had a forged green card a fake green card, which he gave to the University of Georgia because he was working down there. And they said, well, okay, we'll accept this for now, but you have to provide the paperwork before we can pay you. But this is interesting to me because in a sense, you have vulnerable children on the campus and you have somebody there who you don't even know is legal on the campus of Georgia, and yet he's working there. Well, then good old Diego said, hey, bro, come on down from New York. Now, he had already been, uh, uh, the guy on the left now, Jose Ibarra, already had a few issues. Um, <laughs> one of them was, I guess he was driving a car illegally in New York without a license, and the car was not registered. And there's, they some say there was DUI, and his kid was in there without any, I, I don't know what he wasn't wearing. But he was arrested. He didn't show, he, he disappeared. They didn't, before they even, they didn't even check to see if he was legal or not legal. He just disappeared. So he goes down to, brothers in uh, Georgia and they go out shoplifting, <laughs> which kind of makes me laugh. But anyway, they go out shoplifting and they, they steal a whole bunch of crap and which included uh, queso fresco, um, which I'm going to say is probably means you're Hispanic. Um, although I do buy queso fresco because I cook a lot of Mexican food. But anyway, they're Venezuelan. So <laughs> they get caught and guess who doesn't show up for his hearing? Good old Jose Ibarra because he doesn't think the laws matter. Do you know why? Because the laws don't matter. <laughs> I mean, the laws are only as good as they are enforced. So this can comment that he slipped to law enforcement, I don't, he didn't slip to anything. They weren't allowed to do their job, which put a dangerous person back out on the street. Now, did they know how dangerous he was? Well, I will say this, maybe not. I mean, just because a guy's, you know, shopless, there's a lot of people who shoplift who aren't murderers. They're not great people, but they're not murderers. Um, and he, uh, and driving around New York wasn't legally. A lot of people do that all the time too. So is that, does it make him a murderer? No, it doesn't. Should he have been allowed in the country? Again, another political issue. What happened in Venezuela? He's like 26, I think. He's got a lot of years in Venezuela. I wonder what his criminal record in Venezuela was because the viciousness of this crime if we, if he, it's true, he committed it. Uh, a brutal murder of a young woman jogging, beat, beat her brains in, and raped her. Is, could it be his first crime? Possibly, but I'm going to guess, probably not. Uh, and who is this guy coming in from Venezuela? Well, you know, we can't, we're never going to be absolute about anybody. There are people who've lived here all their lives who are, rapist or murderers too. So it's not a matter of just, you know, that the person's an immigrant or not an immigrant or an illegal immigrant or not a legal immigrant. The problem is if we're too lax on all of our laws, then we cannot, we cannot prevent crimes from happening. So where, where a person is already flagged as being a, a, a lawbreaker, we have, we can't seem to do anything about it. So again, please, in the comments below, no political crap, because I will block those things if I can, <laughs> just because this is not a political channel. But I just want to point out the comment that he slipped. He, I, I don't know we can blame law enforcement when law enforcement has to follow the rules that that are, that are out there. But I thought that was <laughs> the guy is like, mm, he and his brother, not the greatest people. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I'm not going to respond to anything that's a, a um, uh, political in the comments. I want to stay away from that. Please, please stay away from that. Um, again, um, just be, and the reason I want to stay away from it is just because I don't want a big political argument over it. Um, we do have a, you know, we have a, anytime we have a problem with law, law enforcement, we have to look at all the issues that uh, affect law enforcement. And the, the thing that affects law enforcement in this country is whoever makes the laws and whoever has to ever is required to enforce them and whether they're allowed to enforce them. 
So I say, don't go into a big political thing. Go to your own channel, do it over there. But just interesting that, thank God they found a borrower because luckily it was an idiot. Um, <laughs> now, a lot of CCTV TV cameras, he got seen on them. There was a witness and he apparently was like throwing away his bloody clothes. So the guy's a moron. And thank God for that. Now, I, it makes me wonder in Venezuela, because things have been such in, such turmoil in Venezuela, did he get away with a lot of stuff down there? Because when a country is in turmoil, when law enforcement goes out of control, I mean, sorry, when crime goes out of control, then law enforcement can't keep up with it. So in Venezuela, all hell is breaking loose down there. So the good people of Venezuela, by the way, can't even go to the store without like a group of people and guns because they're unsafe on the streets. And that's not the way Venezuela used to be. So it's a disaster right down right now down there. Uh, and criminals will take care, take advantage of any time that the, the system is out of control. So that's one, one of the things we're having. And we see a lot of shoplifting going on now. We see a lot of carjackings going on, going on now. We see a lot of, so we're having problems. And so unfortunately, if law enforcement can't, you know, do their job, they can't do their job, you know? So anyway, I'm going to go off in there because I don't want to get bogged down on this, but somebody asked me to talk about it. So I did. Anyway, I want to talk about now the Rachel Morin case. Um, not not uh, the case itself, because again, I, I address this in my link below. The the I was talking about the uh, crime linkage. But I, I just want to mention this because this came out um, just, just like a, just a few days ago, that this is a sketch of the guy that um, was in who is linked to the case of Rachel Morin. Now, the, look at this again. Left is Rachel Morin, and the guy behind me in the, that's coming out of that door, there's a video of him, and and he uh, they supposedly did a home invasion and assaulted somebody in that house. He left DNA. I don't know what kind of DNA. Could just be, you know, I uh, drank out of a beer bottle or something. I don't know what it is, but then he left the place carrying his shirt and shoes, which is weird. And and we haven't heard about, you know, this now, Rachel Morin was attacked back in uh, August of 2023. And this, this, this guy committing that crime was back in March. So six months before Rachel Morin murder, um, he, was, he, was, he was in that home and left his DNA. And people there ha saw him. And yet when Rachel Morin was murdered in August, we, we just saw the video. We didn't see these pictures. Now, six more months later, suddenly pictures. What the heck? Where are these pictures even from? I don't know. Um, and the one thing I pointed out, which people have to be very careful about, is that sometimes witnesses are very good at describing. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're conflating two different witnesses. Like, okay, this witness says his nose is this big, and this witness says his nose is that big. We'll go in the middle. <laughs> you know, this witness says his chin is like that, and the other one says his chin is like that. We'll go in the middle. You know, a lot of people look like a lot of people, and when you muck around with a few of their facial features, you don't know who you come up with. And there's so much, there's there's quite a few funny uh, like. Um, uh, you can find them on YouTube. You can put in uh, TV uh, newscaster um, and a suspect suspect sketch, and you'll see the guy talking, and the suspect catch, sketch right behind him looks just like him. <laughs> it's amazing, and so that goes to show you. Got to be careful. Uh, do I have an objection to the sketch? No. If somebody in uh, L.A. or in Bel Air, Maryland, can recognize this guy for any reasons, and note that he also matches other issues, like the location behaviors and turns them into the police. I'm, I'm good with that. The one thing that bothers me is when you show a photo, uh, when you show a sketch, the police ought to say, this is a sketch. We can't say this actually represents the guy, but we want to know if you know a guy that looks like this, please tell us. But if you know a guy who has all the, who, what, for any other reason, his behaviors, his location, anything, and he doesn't look a bit like this dude, you got to call us too because maybe it's not the maybe the sketch sucks. So, but you have to say that to people. People don't know. So you say if he matches the 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 sketch and he was in those areas and you know something about this guy, let us know. If he doesn't match the sketch at all, but still he's you know there's reasons to think he might be linked to the crime. Still tell us because we don't know exactly what that guy looked like. All we have is a picture of his back. I mean. That's not a lot. So 
Uh, I just think that you gotta be careful with sketches. Um, oh, I've never heard anyone say the dude was barefoot. Um, no, I suppose, uh, supposedly he was carrying, I have to look back at the video. Suppose he was carrying a shirt and his shoes. Oh, maybe I could be wrong. I, I try, I think I did look back at the video at one time. I think he, I don't remember now, honest to God. Um, but there was a whole bunch of stuff out there that he was carrying a shirt and his shoes. So I may be wrong. See, I could be giving wrong information right now. <laughs> I'll have to go back and check that. Uh, sorry. You, I'm a little, now I'm blank. Uh, now I'm blanking. I am blanking. Um, um, if you're comfortable close to home, you might be more likely to be barefoot and walking slow. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, these, they, it's, in fact, he's even got a shirt off is, oh, now why the hell does he have a shirt off? Okay. I know. Let's say the shoe thing is wrong. Why does he have a shirt off? And who goes in to somebody's house on a home invasion, takes their shirt off? Even if you're going to rape somebody, do you, what, you got, you got to feel skin to skin? I mean, or is there another reason you got your shirt off? <laughs> I honestly don't know. It's a very strange case out in LA. And I don't know the people who gave this description, whether they know the guy and are giving a false description, because maybe they always a gang member or something, and we're afraid of them, or whether they're just confused. Or, I don't know. I just, I don't know anything about the LA case. Uh, and the thing that really bugged me was supposedly the concept was, and the mother said this, uh, let me see if I can find the mother's statement. Um, and I thought that is a really strange statement. Um, okay. This statement bugged me. Forgot why I was even doing this piece, but this is, <laughs> this is what bugged me was what Rachel Morin's mom said. I thought it was really a strange comment. Um, yeah, let's see if I can find her comment. Mm, okay. She says, oh, where'd it go? I want that exact comment. Um, suppose, okay, going back here, it says um, in this story, hold on. Is this where it was? All right. Now, witnesses later reported seeing a man resembling the suspect just lurking around the hiking trail. How much they saw him, again, I don't even actually know. Or, you know, it's not, not like there's not a bunch of people who could be there. I don't know what they mean by lurking around. Um, so the sketch is based on descriptions of the man lurking around, as well as an interview with one of the home invasion victims in L.A. So i'm very suspicious of the, of the of the sketch i just really am so it's like okay so the one that should have the best description should be the la people because if the guy sit in your house looking you in your face which apparently he did you should know what he looks like the people on the trail they're thinking back in time oh my god do you remember that there was a guy and he was like lurking around and what did he look like oh well <laughs> that's not as uh, that's very questionable. Okay, so then it says here, um, uh, okay, this one just says shirtless man, no, not the shoes. So maybe that was incorrect. Sorry if I screwed that up. Um, uh, the guy in, in LA, the residents of the LA home did not know the attacker who had entered the home without using the door, which is why no footage of him walking up into the house because he was, you said the footage walking out, but not him. The suspect then violently and physically attacked multiple people, including a child. Okay. I'm not sure that's a sexual assault. Multiple people. I'm going to say something else happened there, like a home invasion kind of thing. A young family member then enters the room, manages to surprise the suspect and begins to force him out of the house. The younger person slams the door, shuts it and locks it and calls the police. Okay. Which is good. But I'm not saying this is sexual assault. So I think I think this this guy was a home invader dude, but he his, his DNA links to the Rachel Moore case. So well, he is a serial killer. <laughs> so there we go. Oh, Los Angeles police confiscated the red Jordan hat from the scene. Oh wow, I did not know that. Okay, I didn't see this in the. Uh, okay, apparently he had that hat, which I guess he he left at the scene. So he takes off his shirt and his hat during a home invasion. But he leaves his hat, only takes a shirt. <laughs> it's just a weird crime, a weird crime. 
uh, as well as a bottle. Oh, that's where the DNA sample came from, was the bottle and the hat. So it's not from a sexual assault. It's just this guy was like, what, for whatever reason, was in these people's houses, house. And it's odd. It just is odd. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound like a sexual assault case. It sounds like something else is going on there. Um, so anyway, um, then it says, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find a bit about that the police had a reason to keep, and I can't find it in this article. The police, the mother was like, hap, okay with the police keeping this information from the public for as long as they, as they did to, to protect the investigation. I, yeah, I don't know which investigation they're protecting, but I, I don't think it makes any sense. You know, you got a guy out there and, and early on, you already haven't caught the dude in six months. And what you, you got his DNA. What you need to do is identify him in the LA killing. And then when Rachel Morin gets killed, you got to identify the guy for that killing, even more important because he's a serial killer. You got to get him off the streets. So you withhold information for what point, what point does it serve? If he, he had this hat on, why wouldn't they show that ASAP? Because somebody might recognize the dang hat. That makes no sense to me. And if that's the way he looked, why, why isn't there a sketch of him back when he attacked the people in LA? And especially if you're going to downplay that because you're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, the guy, I don't, we don't know why the guy went in the house. Maybe it was some, maybe it's a bunch of gang crap. We don't know. I can sort of see why they played that down. If I don't know why it happened, but I see why they played it down. But once the Rachel Marin, Marin case came and linked to that DNA, they should have put everything out there they could put out there that would identify the guy. And it pisses me off that they didn't. They're not protecting any investigation by doing that. That's nonsense. They got his DNA. If he comes and says, you know, it's one of those things where, well, he might know something that only the killer would know. Well, we already got your DNA, dude. I don't care what you say. <laughs> it's like just crazy. Apparently, I didn't know that. This, I just found that out. The red cap was left at the L.A. crime scene. So why wasn't that put out with the Rachel Morin case? It's, I mean, like right away. Because somebody might recognize that hat. He left it in L.A., sure. So maybe more people in L.A. would recognize the hat. But who says somebody in Bel Air might not have recognized the hat, too? Oh, well, because he left it in L.A.? Does that mean he couldn't have owned it? Maybe he was in Bel Air a, a year ago and owned that hat then. And people would recognize that hat and that kind of person that's in that hat. And then he went to L.A. and left it at the crime scene. I don't understand why it's hidden. It just really ticks me off. I don't care what damn database they have. It don't matter to me. It don't matter to me. I, database this, database that. This was this was DNA matching a crime. And once they contacted that department and said, look, we got DNA in, in CODIS from our crime matching your crime. That information is there. I, 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 I don't know. That just really ticks me off. What? Rachel's murder was six months ago. L.A. was... 11 months ago, sure. But it doesn't matter. Once the DNA matched, that's when the Rachel Morin case happened. That's when they should have just taken, okay, we'll give you every piece of information we got from LA and we'll put it out to the public. Why not? What's the, you're not protecting the LA crime. It's not even a, it's not even that bad a crime. Let's put it that way. Okay. It wasn't pleasant, but it wasn't, nobody was raped and murdered. It wasn't that big a deal, but the information from that crime could, well, sorry, just, <laughs> I'm getting excited. Could could solve the Rachel Rachel Moore case quicker so that other people don't get murdered. Okay. Oh, okay. That's, I'm, I'm going to calm down now and go on to something else. Mm -mm -mm. Just pisses me off. I, I don't like when, when information is, is kept from the public that could help the public solve a crime. I just think that's freaking ludicrous. All right. <sighs> let me have a, let me have a little sip of my soda. All right, moving on. Let's move on to Sarah asked me about this one. Okay, <laughs> there's a this is the Delphi case. All right, now I didn't know anything happened in the Delphi case, and I don't think anything has happened in the Delphi case to speak of. However, however, okay, hold on a second. Let me find the oh, yes, here we go. It, now, I couldn't find anything particularly about the case that made any like great progress. I mean, 
the, the uh, defense attorneys are doing whatever defense attorneys do, which is try to block everything from happening. But the article that I did find matching this picture came from the illustrious sun, but the US version of the sun, which means nothing. It means that it still sucks because the sun is absolutely one of the worst rags that ever was put on. Mm. Well, now it's on the internet as opposed to being on your doorstep. Anyway, the store, the, <laughs> the headline is real killer. Wild Delphi murder theory resurfaces as ex-girlfriend. I guess that's, is that the woman in the middle of former person of interest? That's the person of interest on the left. Ron Logan insists he's the killer. Oh my God. It's a, first of all, you shouldn't start out a news story with wild Delphi murder theory. You're supposed to be <laughs> journalism. You don't put wild theories out if you're a journalist. Okay, but they do. And this Forrest McFarland, whoever you are, you're a jackass journalist. Okay, so you aren't a journalist. Sorry, a jackass non-journalist. You're just, you just, hmm, I won't give you a name because I'll probably use my piece of crap statement. Okay, um, <laughs> the ex-girlfriend of former Delphi murders person of interest has insisted that he killed the two teens in 2017. All right, everybody's got an opinion. His girl, he, he, his girl, his ex girlfriend don't like him. All right, now the interesting thing is this. All right, when you go through the whole article, it says, "Let me go through the whole article. It's long." There's a fresh interest only by you, the son, and wh whoever this non-reporter is. Oh, okay, you report. It's not a journalist. All right. On Tuesday, his ex-girlfriend, Connie Dillman, claimed that Logan was absolutely the killer and that the Snapchat video proved it. That's your voice, she said of Logan in an episode because he's dead, so she can say anything she wants. I heard the voice of down the hill thousands of times. It's Ron Logan. Dillman said she first met Logan at a bar and they dated for six years. They connected over shared interest, but their relationship took a turn after he started controlling her life and using her as a tool for sex. <laughs> Isn't that normal in a relationship? <laughs> tool for sex. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the silliest term ever. <laughs> tool for sex. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm laughing uncontrollably. But at, least, <laughs> at least it's not about a baby this time. So, see, this time I won't get so much judgment. Okay. Oh, let's see. <laughs> Dual physics. Mm. All right. At one point, when she tried to leave him, he struck her over the head with a wrench and she had to get six stitches. When I didn't <laughs> want to have sex. He forced it on me. Sorry. Um, uh, <clears throat> yes, you can be raped in a sexual relationship, but you already have a sexual relationship. I'm not laughing about that. <laughs> uh, yes, if you're if you're in any relationship, marriage relationship, boyfriend girlfriend relationship, whatever relationship you're in, you can be raped within that relationship when you do not want to participate in sex, and they they don't care, so they rape you. That can happen. You can be sexually assaulted. So I'm not I'm not laughing at that. I was helpless. Okay. Soon after the relationship ended, I'm kind of wondering how soon after they, they she got hit on the head with a wrench because I'm going to say if I was raped, he hit me on the head with a wrench and raped me, the relationship would have ended in the emergency room. But some soon after their relationship ended, Dillman heard about Libby and Abby's murder and immediately got the sinking feeling he was the killer. Well, you know, the, the bodies were on the edge of his land, so that's why she's going there. It's not unreasonable that he was a person of interest. Um, uh, uh, in the documentary, that we, now we go to the wild theory. In the, in the documentary. Wait a minute, what documentary? What the hell documentary is this? Oh, it's always a documentary. Every time a documentary comes out, you know, there's going to be some kind of nonsense. In the documentary, which I don't know which one it is, a wild theory. Why call it a wild theory? If it's a reasonable theory, it's a reasonable theory. If you're going to call it a wild theory, it's a piece of garbage. So why call it a wild theory? Because you already know it's a piece of garbage. A wild theory on how the girls were murdered was revealed <laughs> after producers reportedly got their hands on materials that were leaked from Allen's attorney's office. Okay. 
So what you're saying here, if it's true, is that the, the defense attorneys leaked something to producers of a documentary. That's not, that's not okay. On either end, it's not okay. Uh, produce, the producers will say, oh, we were doing journalism. No, you, no you're not. You're not. Seriously, you're not. Um, someone who worked for the public defenders shared graphic pictures of the murder scene online in October, leading them to step down from the case because they don't follow the laws and the rules. And I'm not going to even go, go into what the uh, materials showed. Um, this information has yet to be confirmed by officials who have purposely hidden purposely hidden information regarding the crime scene, although the defense attorneys are leaking it and the producers are perfectly happy to talk about it. <sighs> Let's see, anything else on this? Basically, the defense attorneys leaked whatever they, they keep leaking stuff in order to get people like, you know, remember, remember who was supposed to be that, that weird Nordic religion group <laughs> that was supposedly putting all kinds of weird symbols around which is all nonsense uh if i remember i'll put link the link my my video on that the defense term is the defense team is throwing out every piece of crap they can to confuse guess what the future jury because although all 12 people will claim they know nothing about the case all 12 people will know everything about the case and that's what they're hoping to they're, they're hoping to make that reasonable doubt things stick in their mind, not what's presented in court, what, but what, what is presented outside of court. It's a good technique and it should be illegal as hell. In this country, there should be a gag gag order on everything before the trial and we don't do it. It's, it's pretty appalling, but that's, that's what I get on that. Oh, <laughs> Sarah says they're getting around to a gag order. Oh, okay. They're getting around to it. That's nice. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's a little late, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The Odinists. I've forgotten their names, Taylor. <laughs> the old Odinists. The stupidest theory I've ever heard on that case. I will go I will go with the... the so what's his name again? Ron, what is, what is his name again? <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot his name. Ron Logan. Because they were on the edge of his property and he was a little bit squirrely himself, I would go with that is a more reasonable theory than the stupid Odinist theory. Woof. Oh, my goodness. Um, let's see. A tool, a tool can be raped. Apparently so. Oh, my God. I just... <laughs> Stop it. Stop it, Sarah. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I've had two cases where there are horrible things that happened to babies and both of them made me laugh. And it wasn't what happened to the baby is the way it was presented. And I just said, I'm both of them. I'm just going to hell. And I just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been accused of that many, many times in my life. <clears throat> okay. Because no, I won't even get into that. But you know, you got you, you got to have a little bit of fun while you're doing a show. But some things just you know, it's just the ludicrousness of things. Sometimes it just sets me off. <laughs> and that one, that one did, although it wasn't about a baby. Thank God. All right, let me move on to something else. I want to talk about this case, and the reason I want to talk about this case. This is um this here. Um, it has been a case that's been all over the news, and I think it's all over the news for all the right and wrong reasons at the same time. Uh, she is a 10th grader. Her name is Next Benedict. She died after a day after a fight in the bathroom of the Oklahoma high school uh, that she attended. Uh, they use the word uh, pronoun they, but I'm sorry, I can't go with the they pronoun. Just I think it's ridiculous because they to me is two people, and then I get confused about who the hell they're talking about. But again, that's another political thing I'm not going to get into. It's just I find it difficult to 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 read. Uh, but anyway, this uh, one thing I want to point out is this. I don't know what picture this is, but they always tend to put it like a grade school picture of a child. But this is what this is what she looks like. And nothing wrong with what she looks like now. But this is the way she looks now. She's a high schooler, for God's sakes. And here she is in the hospital. This is a screenshot uh, from the uh, released body camera footage of a police officer's interview. I'm not sure why that's already been released. They, 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 um, the police are 
talking to her. That's her mother over there, I think. Um, anyway, let me tell you about this case and what concerns me. Um, because this is this during hangouts, I'm not always just straight up analyzing crime scene analysis, but I'm also looking at how things are presented to the public, which confuses the public on how things are or how things should be looked at or whether we should be patient and wait for information. So next, Benedict. She was a 16-year-old non-binary American student who died after an incident at their high school. Again, there. Sorry. Uh, on February 7th, Benedict told police they were beaten by three girls in a girl's restroom. No, she was beaten. Sorry, I'm just going to go there. I just, I can't, I can't play the game. <laughs> she looks like a girl. I'll call her she. I don't care if she's gay, non-binary, trans, I don't care. You look like a girl, I'm going to call you she, because I just can't do the they thing, because it's two people. Come up with a new word, like he, she, and V. I don't care, but <laughs> they is stupid. Anyway, uh, Benedict died the following day. According to the Owasso police, now, here's where it gets interesting. There was an incident that occurred in the bathroom. And, and believe me, you know, I have one granddaughter, and she is at the moment in public school. Anybody who knows me knows that I homeschooled all three of my children all the way through. Uh, and that was in the 1980s and 90s. I didn't do it because, well, I didn't live in the greatest neighborhood for going to school. And I looked at my three children, and I thought, I'm just not comfortable with what's going on in the school situation. I can't sit here and fight it for the next 12 to 14 years. Uh, so I chose to homeschool because I didn't have the money for private school. And so I homeschooled and I've never regretted it. My kids have grown up. They did fine. They're not, they didn't commit any criminal acts <laughs> as juveniles or adults. My daughter turned into a homicide detective and, and uh, you know, all kinds of other versions of detectiveness. And uh, my two sons are great too. So anyway, <laughs> I homeschooled and the school system is dealing with a lot of issues and always has, by the way, you know, if you can go back a hundred years and there were school fights, depending on where you live, you could get beaten up. You could get beaten up on a prairie of Nebraska and you could get beaten up in downtown Chicago. Kids can sometimes be not too nice. Now I did. I personally, when I was growing up, I was, bullied only in words because I lived in a rich neighborhood and my mother made all my own clothes. And that apparently wasn't something that and when I came to school, girls would go, oh, did your mommy make that for you? <laughs> I was not popular, <laughs> very unpopular. I got word bullied. Okay. Nobody attacked me, but then I also didn't, didn't attack anybody myself. All right. And, um, one of the problems we do have in schools today is that the behavior is going downhill rapidly inside the school as a, you know, even, you know, on the way home, people used to get beat up on the way home, but at least they usually had some relative safety within the school. Uh, but that's gotten really bad. So, um, and, and we have so many, the concept that we are allowed to have so many varying opinions and dress any way we want it used to be, you know, I kind of like the uniform system. Just put everybody in a freaking uniform and tell them on the weekend, I don't care what you look like. <laughs> you know, on the weekend, have at it. But at school, you wear the dang uniform and we do that so we don't have all kinds of stuff going on. But we have gotten to a very free-for-all in school where anybody can dress any way, their hair can be any way, they can do whatever they want, say whatever they want. And because of that, in spite of the fact people used to be oppressed to some extent with their, their belief systems or whatever, and they used to kind of know when to shut the hell up. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm in a school that's all this, and I'm kind of just that. So I'm not saying it's fair, but I'm just saying call it, the problems at least were less. But when you have different varying groups being very vocal about opinions and kids are not nice, it doesn't, you know, they may not even be attacking you for the opinion you think they're attacking you for. They're just attacking you because it's a fun thing and you're not one of them. <laughs> Whatever the one of them is, all right? So anyway, what happened? Let me tell you the story of what happened in the school. <sighs> so anyway, Nex, by the way, she came up from a rough situation. Nex's biological father relinquished all parent parental rights early on and is imprisoned for abuse. Sue Benedict, Nex's grandmother and adoptive mother, raised Nex since they were she was two years old um, and formally adopted her a few months after her uh, death. <laughs> what? But, but, but before the, oh, this is where the they think it has completely throws me off. 
Sue Benedict, Nex's grandmother and adoptive mother, raised Nex since they were two year months old and formally adopted them a few months before their death. I thought they're talking about the grandmother, but okay. So Sue, Sue Benedict, the grandmother, was the one who adopted Nex. A Sue Benedict is enrolled in the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, but Nex was not affiliated with a tribe. And blah, 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 blah. Okay. So anyway, they, I'm not going to get into all the political stuff here or any you know, viewpoints on one side or the other. What happened, though, in the school? And this is where I think you, there are two arguments. You can have an argument over whether you agree or disagree with a student's opinions, behaviors, uh, presentations, viewpoints. That's over here. Over here you have as a profiler and as, a, as a, um, an investigator, and what I think she got to the public is evidence, evidence, not opinion on everything else in the freaking world, evidence. All right. So what happened was there was surveillance footage from the school hallway that showed six students enter the bathroom where the incident occurred before Nex and two other students entered. So you got six over here. This is sign language for six. That's not three. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do, can't do. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Six students over there and three students. That's how you do sign language again. Three students, three students next and the two others. Okay. Um, during 21 minutes of body, body cam footage from next Benedict's interview with the school resource officer recorded on the officer's body camera in the emergency room. Oh, that was a school resource officer. I thought it was a police. I was like, mm, what? Um, this is what next told the officer that they had been jumped, they meaning not, this is where it gets confusing. Not the three of them were jumped, but just Nex herself, she was jumped in the school bathroom and described details of the altercation, including that she had blacked out while on the ground. When they said they blacked out, I thought the whole group of them blacked out. <laughs> okay, Nex recounted being in the bathroom with friends when they overheard comments about their group from a group of three girls. What happened to the other? Okay, so it wasn't six. It was three against three now. Okay. Next. Okay. So apparently they supposedly the group of other three girls made fun of the way the other three girls were talking. Next and her friends were talking about the way they laughed or talked. Uh, well, that happens all the time. Next thing. Next said they, meaning she, poured water on the girls. Who started the fight? Now, words might break, you know, the old thing, you know, uh, they're just words. Sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, they do hurt, but still, there is always a difference between somebody calling somebody a name and somebody or making fun of somebody and somebody assaulting another person. Now, water isn't a big assault. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's just water. Well, but she... You know, girls have their hair done, they got makeup on, and you throw water in, on them. And that is theoretically an assault, not a very big one, but it's an assault. So the assault came from next, not from the three girls. Now, the next thing that happens, next thing that happens <laughs> uh, is um, next was then grabbed by the hair by one of the girls. So she responded and next pushed the girl into a paper towel dispenser. So the girl grabbed her hair and she's got water thrown on her. She went like this. Next throws the girl into a towel dispenser. I'm going to say it's two to one at this point, And the two are more obvious than the one. Then next was on the floor beaten and lost consciousness. I don't, she was beat. I don't know who beat her. I don't know. If she fell when she threw the girl. I don't know. If she fell. See, this is from Nexus point of view. I don't know what the police have determined whether then she was thrown to the floor by another girl and then punched out. I don't have any evidence of this. Um, the officer indicated it's possible. The incident might be seen as mutual and next might fa also face charges. If Sue pursued charges against the three girl, Sue declined at that time. So, there was an altercation in the bathroom, which is questionable. First of all, that next fit was the physical beginning of that. And I don't know that pulling some, grabbing somebody's hair and, throw, uh, and throwing a person are two equal things as well. So my opinion so far, Nexus, 
the per perpetrator so far. Now, if from there on, I don't know. But and then what happens is so next now is in the emergency room. Here she is in the emergency room, right? She goes to the emergency room. And apparently, I think they did a, a CT scan and everything. Because, you know, once you say you hit your head, they do a CT scan. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, you're co totally coherent or whatever. They want to make sure. So they did that. Apparently, didn't find anything. So they, she was talking flu uh, perfectly fine. She wasn't sleepy. Um, she was walking around. A CT, can CT, can scan, can CT scan came up with nothing. So she was sent home, as she should be. They don't need to. And the, so anyway, she was discharged later that day. They had some, supposedly she had some, oh, by the way, officer also said if Nex, if, if Nex appeared to be injured beyond, beyond scrapes and bruises. What is scrapes and bruises? So this is another thing that's been in all the articles, scrapes and bruises. How bad were the scrapes and bruises? You can get a scrape like this. You can get a bruise by, by punching in the shoulder, but does that, that it's, does that cause death? So again, and this is, I don't know who, this is from one side of the version of the story. So anyway, next was discharged later that day and reportedly went to sleep with a sore head. Reportedly, and that's from the family. The following day on Fe February 8th, as they were planning to travel with their mother for an appointment, next collapsed in the family's living room. Sue Benedict called 911 saying that Nex's eyes had rolled back and they were struggling to, to breathe. Next had stopped breathing by the time EMT arrived. She was declared dead at the hospital that evening, which is very horrific. Absolutely very horrific. She's a teenager. That shouldn't happen. No, I, and, but the question is, this is the question, which I wish everybody would just wait. I don't know how bad the altercation in the bathroom became. As far as I can see, supposedly, according to the hospital, she did not have, what did they say? The, the statement was they had no evidence of, um, hold on a second, let me find the original statement. Uh, she was, they, the, the statement they gave was that, um, okay, a medical examiner's office has not ruled out the fight as a possible cause or contributor, but so far they said that they don't see. Okay, the medical examiner had not explicitly said that Benedict's death was unrelated to head injuries. Okay, they're, they're pushing this around. The medical examiner basically said they had no evidence that trauma caused her death. So, but on the other hand, what did cause her death? And we don't know. So they're looking for a toxicology report at this point. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't know exactly what happened in the bathroom. I don't know exactly what, what she died of. I don't know if there's a toxicology issue. I don't know any of these things. And neither does anybody else. I don't know that this has any real true uh, anti-binary violence or whether this is just a bunch of girls acting stupid. I don't know. And the problem is this, is blown, this story has blown up so much and nobody wants to have the patience to wait to find out what all the facts are. And it's just kind of sad because it just, this is one of these things that inflames people uh, before they even know what the heck happened. Um, and um, I mean, it's terrible that a teenager has died. I mean, that's the worst part of it all, but we don't know yet why she died. Um, we don't know if, if it was some just freaky thing that she died, happened to die the day after and had nothing to do with it. Uh, we don't know whether if anybody actually caused it, we just don't know. Um, and this whole high school, you know, we get, but now we have all these charges and uh, accusations and we just don't know. Um, and I just think it's, it's, this is highly, being highly politicized before we have any kind of uh, information on the crime scene analysis and the, and the death analysis. Um, and again, no, nothing, no child should be bullied. No, that's a horrible thing. And maybe our schools need to stop having a lot of bad behavior in them. It doesn't matter who's being bullied. It doesn't. And I, you can give all kinds of labels you want to every kid. But nobody should be physically bu bullied, that's for sure. Um, bullying with words has, has gone on forever. But, you know, teaching children to be polite to each other doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. 
you know, whether you are a different political viewpoint or whether you you have different viewpoints on different social issues, I can be nice to you anyway. And that's what should be taught in the schools. But, you know, we, we have to get to the point where we stop, make, we have to make school a place where you go for learning uh, your basic ABCs and geography and history and science and all that kind of crap. Try to keep all your social gar garbage out of there because you're just inflaming things. Now, let that be the family's business. Let that be the community. Let that be your, your friends and, and whatever you're involved with. I, I personally think just let, let's have school just be for teaching basics and um, the stuff that does, doesn't cause a whole bunch of fights. And let's tone that down and teach each other to be nice to each other and say, you know, everybody's got a different opinion regardless of who they are. And we just, we just have to learn that we don't bring all of that from outside into the school. And that's something I think we're failing to teach um, because I remember going to my job as a sign language interpreter in the hospitals when I did that. And I had had, I might've had the worst day ever. But when I arrived at that hospital, I could have been driving like this. When I got to the hospital, I walked in and said, hi, what's up? Hi, you know, I'm your interpreter. I never brought that into the hospital. It wasn't my, my place to bring my personal life, my personal viewpoints, my personal emotions into the hospital. And um, you don't bring that to work. And in my opinion, you try to keep it out of the schools as well. You try to focus on learning because there's so many things to learn in that six hours. You can do all the other crap on the weekends and in the afternoons. You can go to all the clubs you want, all the political rallies you want, all the churches you want, all the non-churches you want. But in school, let's focus on school. But, you know, we have this thing going on now. And um, so we have a case here where we just don't really know. And it's being it's just exploding all over the place. And we haven't even got the results back of the toxicology reports yet or anything else to know what exactly happened in this case. And it's just we have a, we have a, we have a child who died and it's terrible. And let's not explode. So that's just my thought on it. So anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, but interesting. Um, uh, there's a good point. Don't don't start respect others. Don't start an argument to win it. You got to, and especially with teenagers, man, they can be nasty little creatures. So you got to, yeah, work overtime with them. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, uh, oh shoot, common sense isn't common. Well, we're kind of yeah, it may not be, but I think a lot of times we, I, I believe uh, that's why I have an issue with the media. I think that um, a delayed concussion. I don't know, Lex. So they they didn't come up with anything. She wasn't uh, she wasn't acting. She's sleepy. She no. You're supposed to stay awake as long as you can after you have had a, a fight like that to make sure that you don't have a concussion. Usually they see something in the CT, but even if they don't, they want you to walk around for a long time and 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 not show. Um, so you don't go to sleep and you know you miss out on the fact they're actually having that concussion. So don't know. Um, well, it won't be suicide. Well, probably not. <laughs> that doesn't seem likely. But um, again, we just have to wait. And and we, we're a very impatient world. We have 24-hour media and nobody wants to wait. Um, there's a lot of cases I don't talk about. And people say, why don't you talk about this case? It's because I don't, I don't have enough solid information to make an opinion or to even analyze um, without just going, just going off on you know, some tangent and saying, maybe. Maybe. No, the maybe is. Um, again, we don't know. Did she feel cornered? Well, she didn't say she felt cornered. She said she was annoyed with the things that they said to her. Uh, the, they laughed at her. I don't know why, they, you know, leaving the bathroom would probably be the more appropriate thing. She did admit to throwing the water. And of course, it's just water, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's hard to say. Um, uh, we don't know that, Taylor. The examiner said she did not. He did not see signs that she died of trauma. The, that leaves us with what did she die of? She died of something. Okay, um, it could be a delayed concussion problem. It could be. It could be that I don't know. We just don't know, and that's the whole point. We don't know. So, so media, tone it down. Tone it down, media. All right. I want to go on to talk about who is this. Oh, I just have to do this because, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this particular case. Um, wait, hold on a second. I'm about to, hold on, well, hold on. Got to disappear a sec. Forgot to plug my iPad in. It's going to die on me. Okay. Um, I, I've talked about this case before, 
This is Veruca Salt. As I said, she bought, she stole that from, I think, a band. But anyway, that's not her real name. It's Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly. Her, it, 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 there's a very, there's a, the reason I brought, bring this up again, just because I'm, I talk a lot about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Okay, Veruca Salt, also known as Kimberly, Kimberly Hartley. So Kimberly Hartley is a real name. She calls herself Veruca Salt. She has, uh, she's had a long history of prostitution and she has a, um, um, OnlyFans channel where she was, she did uh, sex stuff all the way through her pregnancy, and then she had this baby. I don't know what her daddy is, but anyway, she had this baby, and the baby was uh, six weeks old, I think. Yeah, six weeks old, and then she put this video out. So it was very sad because he had died in his sleep, sparking and outpouring tributes. Okay, people were, you know, sad. You know, if somebody lost their baby, it's terribly sad. But I have to say. The reason I brought it up originally wasn't because it's not a horribly sad thing, but as a profiler, I want people to understand, especially people who work in hospitals, that you have to look at their history. Uh, Kimberly Hartley, her real name, has a history of high-level narcissism. She le she was at a friend's wedding, and she after the wedding, she just vanished, leaving her things there, and what disappeared, and everybody thought she had been kidnapped. For like a week it's good and no the police were looking for her. they couldn't find her and of course her stuff was still there so they assumed she'd been abducted and kind of like ruined her friend's honeymoon and then they found her working at a brothel well she faked she hoped she it's a hoax she faked an abduction on purpose that says that's a sign of psychopathy so now we have she, she she has all kinds of behaviors which are really concerning and then she has a baby and she looks really happy in the the, the videos i mean she looks like she loves the baby and this is where you got to be careful it's like maybe she did love the baby maybe the baby died of natural causes because even people who are psychopaths and i'm not saying she is one even a person who is involved in things that are very okay i won't even use the word she her, no matter what you can have a baby and it die of natural causes, a SIDS death. You can have that. So far, they, they have not said there's any proof of anything, any kind of wrongdoing. So far, they're still doing, they're, they're still looking into the still investigation is still open to some extent. I don't know how, what kind of extent. But then this article came out and it just, it just, I thought it was fascinating. Okay. Gold Coast Influencer. That's a concern. If you're influenced by a person who does sex while they're pregnant on OnlyFans, you should you, you need to take a look in your own mirror. Uh, Gold Coast influencer and TikTok star Baruka Salt took her baby to the hospital and later assured followers her baby was fine, just hours before the newborn tragically died. On Sunday, she revealed in a TikTok video that the pair were off on Cash's first trip to the hospital because he hadn't pooped in seven days. Okay, now, first of all, I don't know, I don't know the validity of her claim because she likes to claim things that aren't true. So he hadn't pooped in seven days. That's called dehydration. He's a six month old baby. They poop constantly, constantly, unless they dehyd massively dehydrate. Or, it's not true. Maybe he pooped just fine, but she wants to take him to the hospital anyway. So hold on a second. Come on, website, come back. All right. Uh, she took her newborn baby cash to the hospital after getting a feeling something was wrong. A feeling. Doctors said he was fine. Hours later, tragedy struck. So... It doesn't seem like the doctors found anything wrong with them, but she has a feeling and she's making a claim that he hasn't pooped in seven days, which is concerning that she's saying that, whether it's true or not. Munchausen, people who exhibit Munchausen syndrome by proxy sometimes make up stuff. And also, if you take your baby to the hospital the day before he dies, you can say you were being a good mother and you thought something was wrong with him. You took him to the hospital and, and you believed the doctors and then the baby died. Well, I'm not going to say the baby didn't die of natural causes. I can't say that. Let's see. 
she says, Veruca replied to this person who said she had been breastfeeding. It was all natural that they, her children had the same problem as little cash. She, that they, that person said they had been breastfeeding. It was all natural. What, that they don't poop for seven days? Okay. Veruca replied, yeah, that's why I'm not, I, that's why I'm not super panicked because he's actually fine. I just wanted to check. But hours later, the baby died. I'm waiting to find out what happened to the baby. I'd like to, but you know, a lot of times this is a problem. Uh, babies, uh, it's very hard to prove why a baby died. Um, SIDS deaths are very hard. Some SIDS deaths are just absolute SIDS deaths. You know, the child died. They can't come up with an explanation. There's nothing ever done to that. Nobody ever harmed that child. But then there's other possibilities where the, ch the child was smothered, either on purpose or mommy rolled over on baby when mommy was drunk, that's happened. And yet they still can't, they have a hard time proving it. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, children's deaths, babies' deaths go, they're just, they just let it go because they, they have a hard time proving anything. And that's why so, it, it's easy to get away with as, as a crime. Um, but I always say, look at the history behind it. Now, the history behind it, as much as, you know, you can look at history and say, okay, that person really concerns me. All their behaviors concern me. Can you still prove that the person did something to the child? That's a question. Not necessarily. Because then a person could have behaved in every single way I just said, but the baby died naturally. But I just want to point out that there are more, I have that feeling that there's some, it's, it's suspicious death to me. Um, and now that she's, you know, she said she, she has this story about going to the hospital right before the baby dies. Just doesn't sit right with me. And, but that's what the, the medical examiner is there for. And I don't know what to come up with, but I just find it interesting. And I just say as a med, as a, as a person in the hospital, as a profiler, as an investigator, as a medical examiner, you got to take into behavior, uh, take into account behavior. That's so important in trying to determine whether you should be looking at this case as a possible suspicious death or not. There's other cases where, there's just nothing that you would look at the mother and say, Psh, or the father and say, gosh, I can't imagine them doing a thing. That person has always been a, just a great parent. Um, just there's no way in God's earth. But when a person exhibits psych psychopathy, which she does, then you got to wonder. You got to wonder. Um, oh, is that Veruca Salt was a character in Willy Wonka too? And the band. I, I don't know if she named herself after the band of Willy Wonka. I didn't know it was in Willy Wonka, too. That's interesting. Oh, my goodness. Um, you say, I think she suffocated the baby. Don't know. But I found I didn't know about the, the thing to the hospital. And I just find that's one more thing that makes me suspicious. If I, As a profile, it makes me suspicious. By the way, suspicion doesn't mean guilt. There are some really suspicious people out there. And after all the suspicions in the world, you find out they didn't commit a crime. <laughs> You're like, wow. Go figure. Um, but it's, so we don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they know, uh, but I just, th this is correct. Suspicion is not proof, but it's good to, good. It's, it's good to pause. Yes. If you are working as in, in the hospitals, you got to pay attention to these things. And a lot of nurses and doctors, in spite of people saying, oh, they get all that training. No, they don't. Because I worked in hospitals and it's amazing how many people didn't recognize the behaviors of Munchausen syndrome by proxy because I had clients who had it, had it. When I say had it, it's a behavior of psychopathy. They exhibited psychopathy. They exhibited Munchausen syndrome by proxy and whoosh, right over the heads of the doctors and nurses. And I used to interpret and go crazy because I'm thinking, my God, she's trying to kill that baby off. <laughs> and they didn't have a clue. They're like, oh, she's such a good mother. No, she's not a good mother. She wants you to kill the baby. <laughs> it's like, they just didn't get it because they weren't familiar with it. Um, shaken baby. Um, I don't know that they have any evidence of that yet. I don't, the autopsy hasn't come back supposedly. So I don't know what, what, what they have um, so far. Um, yes, this is a good, that's a good, that's a good point. Suspicion means rule it out. I like that. That, that is, that is true. Um, in other words, if you have no suspicion is you probably don't have much to rule out, but if you do have suspicion, you should rule that out. When we look back, for example, at the McCann, uh, the Madeline McCann case, people get really upset, some people, some people, that I personally have suspicions uh, about the, the, the McCanns and what happened to their child. 
And people are like, how dare you? How dare you just accuse the parents of blah, 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 blah. I said, no, I have suspicions. I have suspicions based on evidence. So what should you do with those suspicions? Like you say, rule it out. When Scotland Yard came in, they should have ruled out. They should have examined everything and found, if they found enough evidence to rule out the McCann's, so be it. They didn't do that, though. They were told not to investigate the McCann's at all. That was the remit. Don't have any suspicions about them. You're not allowed to have a suspicions. Who does a case like that? But that's true. I like that. Suspicions mean you need to look at some, look at people and rule them out. Because, and that that is true in every case. Um, because you can have a lot of suspects or uh, persons of interest. Let's say persons of interest. You have persons of interest. And people will say, oh, for example, uh, I got I got people really upset in the, um, uh, the Idaho case. Because I originally pointed out that they had to look at that boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend. I said the police have to look at him because he had broke, he's broken up with one. Uh, she broke up with him. Uh, it's a recent breakup. He had her dog. Um, he's in the area. I don't know what the police know, but I said they're going to have to look at him as a, as a person of interest. They're going to be suspicious because of recent recent events. And people got really upset with me. They said, oh, my God, you're accusing him. I'm not, no, I'm not accusing him. I'm saying they have reasons to be suspicious and they have to rule him out. Well, they did rule him out. Eventually, they ruled him out. I don't know what they had more information than I did. And I don't know how quickly they ruled him out, but they ruled him out. Because it wasn't him. That's their job. But if, you, if you're a detective or a profile and you're never suspicious, you need to get another job. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that? You nailed that case better than anyone I know. Uh, I thought it was an incel, but you know, eventually. But you know, um, but that's just oh, married Beth Tinning, correct, uh, Sarah? She she killed nine nine children. One was, and, and they always thought that the doctors kept saying, oh, it just must be some biological hereditary thing until her adopted son died, <laughs> and then the biology thing went flying out the window. Why weren't they suspicious? My God. Is it really likely that that one child after the another like that is going to die? Probably not, you know. So, yeah. So that's 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 the whole point. Um, suspicion. I like that. Suspicion is to rule out. I think that's a very good statement. I love it. Okay, let's see what else. I'm going to look at my time here and decide what I want to talk about next. Oh, I was asked to look at two missing persons cases, and I want to do that. Okay, so this is Marshall Iwasa. Uh, he went missing in uh, British Columbia, um, and there, there's two, there's there's great differences between the two cases, which I thought is why it's interesting to look at. All right, so that's him, and that is his that is his truck found at the trailhead, burnt out. Now, let me let me read you what happened to him. Uh, well, I'm gotta find it. Now here we go. Um, So it's one of these interesting cases where prior to him going missing, when you first read about it, you have a mom who says, oh, you know, everything's just fine and dandy. But as time goes on, you get more information. Uh, they search for this guy. Uh, let's see where it is. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, they started examining his personal affairs in the month leading up to his disappearance. He had stopped attending uh, post-secondary classes um, they checked his financial, medical, and, and social media activity. And there's evidence to suggest he was experiencing stress in his life and had become withdrawn. He um, visited a storage locker right before his disappearance. And then, according to the police, the storage locker key and log show his code was used to enter the facility. But then about two hours later, he left the compound. And then they found his burned out vehicle in a remote and mountainous area in, in British Columbia in November of 2019. They examined the vehicle and they offered no, it offered no evidence to suggest a criminal offense had been committed and no evidence to suggest that anyone other than Iwasa was present when the vehicle was burned. I'm not sure how they know that, but they've discovered some of his clothing in the forest in a trail leading away from his vehicle. Um, so it says here, his burned out truck remains, the burned out truck 
remains, the remains of the burned out truck. Where it was located, they, uh, wait a minute, it was an extremely challenging remote terrain where it was found. Due to the winter conditions when the vehicle was first located, there was a rock slide blocking the access road, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, it was in a very remote area. They came up with no particular evidence except some of his clothing on a trail. So, was he murdered? Did he commit suicide? Did he wander off? Well, when you look at a case like this, you see, you see behaviors prior that show a slide into depression. Then he goes off to some incredibly remote place and disappears. Now, the chances of him, let's say, two possibilities. He picked up a hitchhiker and the hitchhiker killed him. But the, what did the hitchhiker do? Drive the vehicle to a very, very remote location, leave it, and then hike down a mountain? I mean, probably not. I mean, you know, usually when you when you kill somebody, you they pick you up or whatever, uh, for, for whatever reasons, you're with somebody else, and they do you in. The best thing is to leave you on the side of a road someplace and then run off where you can get home. <laughs> you don't go, you drive way up into the mountains. The only way you do that is you have a second vehicle. Now, could he have driven into the mountains and met a hiker? And that hiker at that moment decided to kill him um, and then burn up his vehicle and then hike off? I mean, you start getting into things that are extremely unlikely. So they've never found his body. Uh, so my guess is he went far off into the mountain. And when you go far into a mountain, the, the way bodies are normally found is by hikers and by dog walkers. And so the farther you hike and if you go off trail, Chances of anybody finding you are really limited. You might be found in 20 years. So in this particular case, would I lean toward suicide or would I lean toward homicide? I would lean toward suicide because could it be homicide? Well, the police have done their investigations. They can't come up with anything that points to homicide. Now, will that satisfy the family? A lot of times, no, because they don't want to believe their child was depressed and walked away and, 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 and didn't come back. They want to believe that, you know, they didn't miss the signs and that he was, you know, somebody did him in. That's a normal response. Oddly, you'd think it would be the opposite, but it never is. Um, rarely does a person accept that a person committed suicide unless uh, it's real, real, super obvious. But even then I've seen people, you know, even if they leave a suicide note that it layers everything out, somebody will come along and say that somebody else forged a suicide note. It's amazing what people don't want to accept with suicide. Um, but I would say in this case, I don't see, I think it's most likely suicide. Um, uh, could have gotten a gun out of the locker? I don't know. I don't know what was in the locker. Nobody's talked about what was in the locker. Um, bikers. Well, uh, it's okay. All right. Um, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, let me think about this. Okay. Um, I want to think about this. All right. Bikers. That, that is a better scenario than um, a vi another v major vehicle going up there, another truck or whatever going up there. It's a remote area. Um, I would have to, I would be off, it would have to be off-road biker type people. But you know, again, I think, you know, you have to look at, it can't, I, I think the, the police should look at that. So again, I think that's awesome when you come up with a possibility that should be investigated. Um, I would think because of his previous behaviors and going to a remote place, it probably is a trajectory. Now, there's always that weird possibility that, man, I was depressed. I just wanted to go hiking in the middle of nowhere. And I got up there and bikers showed up and killed me. <laughs> is it possible? I guess. But his body probably would have been found, more likely to be found. So I like the suggestion, uh, and I hope the police did investigate that. They didn't find any other tracks or anything near his vehicle. So I guess that's one reason they didn't think anybody was up there with him. And I don't have all the details of the the the, the, the location of the uh, the, the um, truck to know what what they saw around the truck. I don't have all that information. I'm only pointing out what when you look at certain crimes, um, you can say what's more likely than not. But if I were investigating it, I definitely want to investigate homicide as well as possible suicide. So um, I don't know why he'd burn the car. Car is convenient when you're trying to get away, but he still has his personal belongings. Uh, 
Well, okay. So let's say you you were you, if you were the hitchhiker who decided to attack him, you would just drive the vehicle away. You, you know why would why wouldn't you take the vehicle and get out of there? You know, take all this stuff too, burning the vehicle. Um, now I'll go back to Sarah on that. If you were like some biker gang who for some reason surrounded him and whatever tortured him and thought it was a fun thing to do, and then they just lit the thing on fire. Um, that's more possible than maybe I say somebody like a hitchhiker, but um, did he burn it up himself? It's hard to say. It really is. I mean, you know, he's a more likely person to have done it. And people say, well, why would he even bother? Why just just walk away? And that's another good question. This is, there's outstanding questions. There's no, that's for sure. But the trajectory of his depression, getting whatever he's getting out, going up to a remote area leans towards suicide. But if I were a family member, I want everything to be properly investigated. And I don't know, you know, that so far they haven't found him and they haven't come up with any evidence of a, a homicide. So um, uh, that's, that's all. Hey, they said, whoever they is, which is maybe the police, it may be the media. Nothing, it's, uh, nothing was missing. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's proving a negative. I don't know how you prove that crap. Um, so, but I want to talk about this other, this other case which is much more obvious to me, but what is more likely to have happened. And this, this is, um, this is Sarm, Sarm Heslop. Sarm Heslop. She's a, well, she seemed like a pretty, um, I don't know, very active, uh, happy. I don't know. Just on this picture, she just looks like one of these confident people. She's, she's, she's out there. She's, you know, working on the boats and stuff. It's pretty awesome. Um, she was a British woman who went missing from a catamaran. There's the catamaran. And I think that might be the dinghy that went to the catamaran, but I'm not sure. I'm not a boat person, but that's the catamaran, which a catamaran um, is, you know, it's a pretty stable, stable type of boat. You know what I mean? And it was sitting and um, where was she at? I'll tell you where she at. She was off of St. John's, the western coast of St. John's in the Virgin Islands. And this happened in March of 2021. So, she was last seen by a third party at a restaurant. And this was about supposedly 10 o'clock at night. She was at this restaurant with her boyfriend. And she was believed to have taken a dinghy with her boyfriend back to the yacht she was staying on. And here is boyfriend. Hey, hi, guys. This is our Ryan Bain, her then boyfriend, who reported her missing. He reported that she was missing sometime after 2.30 local time. So about Four hours from the time they left the restaurant, got in a dinghy, went back to the boat. There was, um, he reported her missing. He did, apparently didn't, he actually took the dinghy back in, I think, and contacted the police from the shore. Since then, since then, there have been multiple searches, but no indication of what happened or why she went missing. Now, uh, she was, uh, she was uh, Heslop, 41 at the time of her disappearance. She was staying on a 47-foot cattle ram, the siren song in the U.S. Virgin Islands. She was working with her boyfriend, Ryan Bain, a native of Michigan, on the catamaran as a, as a chef. Uh, oh, wait a minute. As a chef in the luxury yacht business, they were available for private charters. Uh, she'd also been a flight attendant. Anyway, they were there. Um, they were observed earlier in the day by another couple, and they seemed to be calm. They should have left the restaurant by 2200, which is 10 o'clock, and returned to the siren song. As though they were under COVID curfew at the time. Interesting. The catamaran was moored in Cruz Bay some 200 feet, 61 millimeters distant from the shore, which would have meant the two taking a dinghy between the shore and the catamaran. The last person to see Heslop before her disappearance was her boyfriend, who stated she was asleep by 10 o'clock. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> if they left the restaurant, they should have left the, left, left the restaurant at 10, gotten a dinghy. I hope she's not asleep. <laughs> you know, She's got to be awake from the restaurant to the dinghy into the boat. But somehow she's asleep at 10 o'clock, which seems awful early to me. So I, 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 the times might be off here. Um, the boyfriend says she was asleep at 10 o'clock. But at 2.30 in the morning, she's missing. Okay, first thing I'd like to know, and I can't find that here, was I want to know whether all the waters were calm that night around St. John's. In other words, you're in a nice catamaran is fairly stable boat. Um, and if it's nice, calm waters, how do you go missing off a catamaran? 
and she's sleeping. And he's her boyfriend. I'm going to say they sleep together. <laughs> so he's saying that they went to sleep. They're both sleeping. It's an, a catamaran's not a big thing either. It's not like you can't find each other on the boat. So they're both sleeping, theoretically, together. Somehow she gets out of bed without him noticing. He's a guy. That's probably possible. Gets out of bed. Now, they had an early night, 10 o'clock. I'm pretty sure she's not drunk off her butt. She went to sleep early. Uh, it's not like they were out to two in the morning and she's trash drunk. Then you can say, oh, okay, she got up and fell off the boat. Like I think Natalie Wood. Okay, you can check my Natalie Wood. I don't have a link below, but you can just check my Natalie Wood thing. I believe she was not murdered, but uh, but she was very drunk. And there were there were all there were all kinds of emotional things going on. She could have been pushed overboard, but I don't you know. I think she made she went up on deck and wasn't in a very good shape. But if this woman goes to bed at ten or even close to ten, I'm pretty sure she wasn't that drunk. So if she drank at all, I don't even know if she even had anything to drink. But she's sleeping in bed next to her boyfriend. She gets up in the middle of the night and falls off a catamaran. Look at the catamaran again. It's a catamaran. And it, it, unless there's um, really bad water, she, if she went out to get a, a breath of fresh air, she shouldn't just fall off the, she can swim. She shouldn't just fall off the catamaran. And if there's not strong current, she should be able to swim back to the catamaran, just climb back in. Unless she got eaten by a shark. Okay. So what he did, the boyfriend, so after he found she was missing at 2.30 in the morning, he took the dinging out to the island to report her absence to the police who advised him to call the Coast Guard. However, it was not until 11.45 a.m. that he contacted the Coast Guard. Wait a minute. Your, girl, your, your, your girlfriend has just disappeared off the boat and you take hour, hours and hours to call the Coast Guard to go search for her? She could be out there struggling to swim. She, You know, you can... If you're a good swimmer and you know how to float and the water's calm, you can float for hours. Where the heck? Where, why wouldn't he call the Coast Guard? But he didn't. He didn't call the Coast Guard till 11.45 in the morning, a gap of nine hours. He's been questioned by, this has been questioned by Heslop's family and a fellow skipper. They're like, what the heck? What was he doing all that time? Why didn't he just, he made the phone call to the police, but he didn't. But nobody went out to his boat. Nobody looked for her. Okay. He also, despite the police being invited onto the boat, it was reported the boat has never been searched or its owner questioned. The refusal to allow authorities to search the boat was on the advice. Wait a minute. Were they invited onto the boat or weren't they invited onto the boat? The boyfriend's attorney said, don't have them on the boat. However, the local police did issue citations to Bain on account of not being allowed to search the boat for not having registration documentary or and for safety equipment violations. Those weren't criminal charges, they were civil. Heslop's phone, wallet, and passport were all found on the catamaran. And considering that the that the um, uh, the dinghy was there, she didn't get in the dinghy and, and go away. So she couldn't have left the boat by the dinghy. She obviously went overboard one way or the other. Uh, she was level-headed, a strong swimmer. <laughs> Nobody understands why she would get out of bed and go swimming between 1030 and one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, probably not. Um, uh, the family of Heslop asked uh, the Virgin Island police to show them the CCTV of them leaving uh, the restaurant. Um, they wouldn't show them the end of the video, which was really weird. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the Virgin Island police, but anyway. Um, part of the complaint about this by Hep Heslop's family was that in the footage, she was not in what she had been described as wearing. I don't know that that's meaningful. Um, anyway, that's where it stands. Do I think she was murdered or do I think she had an accident or do I think she fell overboard? What do you think, guys? Did he push her? Well, if he pushed her, theoretically, she could then swim back. To the boat or if she's smart she goes swim to the dean get the hell out of there but um 
Oh, he must have needed some beer to calm down. Well, that's interesting. You know, time, there's a little extra time in there, you know. Um, a sailor would know how to radio the Coast Guard? Well, of course. Of course. And the, you know, that's pretty. <laughs> Red flags are abound. That's for sure. Um, no question. Um, Oh, are you are you are you bugging me about Nancy Ng again? I'm doing nothing about Nancy Ng today at all. <laughs> Another person who possibly went into the water, but not necessarily murdered. Uh, I don't, I don't know the. Oh, anyway, I don't know the method, but the boyfriend did it. <laughs> um, he's looking bad. Let's put it that way. This looks like a homicide. It does not look like an accident or a suicide. This looks like a homicide. Why? Because we're suspicious of his behaviors which should make him somebody to eliminate, right? So uh, good. That's, that's good profiling. Let, let's try to rule him out, but he's not very rule, rule, rule outable, <laughs> rule outable. <laughs> uh, there was a claim he didn't have a cell phone on there. I'm only looking from Wikipedia here. So um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> His time gasp. What, 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 I'm not sure what that is. Um, the boyfriend is the only one who said she went to bed at 10 o'clock. Of course, he was the only one on board with her. That's awfully early. I mean, it's really early. Now, it may, maybe they maybe they did. You know, it's dark. Uh, they've worked hard all day. They've gone out to eat. Maybe they like to get up very early in the morning to do boat things. I'm not a, I'm not a boater. I don't know what you do on a boat. You know, so... Um, maybe they do get up very early because of the sunrise because you're on a boat. So maybe you do go to bed at 10 and get up at six, but that he would not know what he's sleeping next to her and doesn't know what happened to her. She just got up in the middle of the night and decided to go aboard and fall over. Uh, and that's just, let's put it this way. Um, a little suspicious. So the first one missing person there's there's uh, behaviors leading up to the more likely probability that he committed suicide. The second one, none of her behaviors appear to be suicide type of thing or stupidity. And a lot of behaviors on his part are real questionable. So that's that's how you look at cases. But of course, that doesn't prove anything. Absolutely. OK, let me go on to a couple more things here. I want to talk about these two. OK, which one? Oh, this one will. Uh, this is other breaking news today. If you remember this case, I did talk about it. This is this lovely person. Um, and the lovely definitely is in quotes. All right. Um, this is the Ohio mother who left that little child. Uh, this, uh, she's 20, 32 years old. She left her baby daughter, Jalen, uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a playpen. And she went off to, where did she go off to? She went on a vacation for 10 days to Detroit and Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As we all do. We don't take her. She took her other child. I think it's an older daughter. So this is really weird. She took her older daughter, but didn't take the baby. And she'd left the baby before and, and neighbors had complained about that and tried to do something about it. But I don't know why social services hadn't removed that child from her care. So I blame social services if they were called. Um, I don't know that they were ever contacted or the, uh, the, or the neighbors were just like, oh, well, help, you know, don't leave that baby alone. But so she left the baby for 10 days and they found the baby, of course, died of dehydration. 16 month old baby. Anyway, she died of starvation and, and, and severe dehydration. She was charged with, this is where I start losing my mind, charges of aggravated murder two counts of murder, felonious assaults, and endangering children. I'm good with all of that. That, to me, should mean you go to prison for the rest of your life without parole. Uh, I, I, you don't need to come back out. Because it's a pre, it was a premeditated murder. Don't tell me it's not premeditated. Some people go, oh, she didn't think what she was doing. No, she left the country for, well, she didn't leave the country. Puerto Rico is in America. Um, but she got on a plane and left the area for an extended vacation, knowing full well that child had no food or liquid. That's premeditated homicide. She wanted that. She didn't care about that child. She wanted that child gone out of her life. That child was just a pain in the butt. Maybe the older kid was better because she, she, she just, you know, could do more things. I don't know why she didn't leave the older kid there to take care of the younger one, considering the way she is. I don't understand the thing about the older kid. The information is a little shady on that. But anyway, 
So that's what she got charged with. But get this. They made a plea deal. Why do you need a plea deal? Is, it, is there some information we don't know about? Did she not have a plane ticket and went off to Puerto Rico? Is there not proof that she left the child unattended? What the heck? Then it says here, um, they declined to go into the details of the plea deal. They knocked off a few things from there, which really pisses me off. Now, the plea deal got, so where was the one she got? Wait, let me see what she got. What was what? What did they give her? They took away some things. They took away. Uh, hold on, long article. Let me find out what they took away. Um, like I'll get to that in a minute because it's somewhere. Um, the, her attorneys though declined to go into details about the plea, the plea deal. This was a real emotional day for our client. I'm trying not to throw up. Uh, she has taken responsibility for what she did, and she is remorseful. Get out of here. Get out of here. This woman is a psychopath. She's not remorseful. She didn't care about that child. She cared nothing about that child. There will be mitigating issues that come up at sentencing that we will address. Mitigating issues? What? That she just needed a vacation desperately? She couldn't like ask, she couldn't drop the child at a relative's. She couldn't drop the child at a neighbor's house and say, look, uh, my boyfriend's going to kill me. Uh, I take care of my kid. Goodbye. She couldn't drop the kid at a hospital, a police station, anything. No. Hopefully people will realize she's is not the monster that some see her as. No, no, she's a monster. You're a defense attorney. You're a monster too. <laughs> not all defense attorneys, but the ones who say that, sorry, you make me sick. Um, they said she's suffering from mental health issues. Really? She was able to take a vacation, buy a plane ticket. What mental health issues? Oh, yes, a psych psychopathy. That's what it is. It is unclear why she didn't ask anyone to help her care for a child, because she didn't care. It's not the first time she was left, left her daughter home alone. We kept telling, the neighbor said, we kept telling her, don't leave her by herself. No. The minute that woman leaves that little child by herself, you, you, call, you call social services. 911 it. Apparently, they didn't do that for whatever freaking reasons. Um, uh, I can't figure. I can't find the thing that says, "Oh, they had no previous cases in social services, and they had no cases." So the neighbors were pretty useless, in my opinion. That's that's that's, that's horrific. So that is one case. I'm going to tell you about the other case, and then you can t you can t tell me your thoughts on both of them. This is the other case. No, that's not it. Wait a That's this one. Sorry, clicking badly. All right. Uh, this case is a Las Vegas case. Um, sorry, it's a little dark here. It's hard to see. Uh, but anyway, daddy's on the left and stepmommy is on the right. A judge sentenced the stepmother of six severely abused children to seven to 18 years in prison. Not enough. Not enough. For failing to intervene to protect the children. Amanda Stamper, 33, spoke in court moments before learning of her fate. I'm embarrassed to be here. I know I should have done something sooner. You think? What, did, what, what happened, you say, if you don't know this case? She says, I do take full responsibility for it. I was not in the best situation, and I was scared. Okay, I'm going to tell you what the kids experienced, and I'm going to talk about she wasn't in the best situation, and she was scared. In June of 2023, Las Vegas Metro Police found the six children home alone. Two of them were locked in a dog cage. The oldest was 11 years old. Body camera video showed officers rescuing the children who all showed signs of abuse. Allegations dated back to 2019. What the heck? Four years of abuse? What the why, is, why are these children in the care of these two horrible people? Stamper's husband, Travis Doss, a seemingly unsuccessful rapper. Well, he's got emotional problems. That's why he abused the kids because his rap sucked. He was known as Trap Montana. and He was accused of abusing the children. He kept one of the children locked in a dog cage for five days while also starving him. The child was severely malnourished. Every single day, the defendant failed to protect her six stepchildren. Her actions and inactions will affect these children for the rest of their lives. She pleaded guilty to three felony counts of child abuse, neglect, and endangerment. 
It should be attempted murder. In my opinion, when you starve children and put them in cages, that's attempted murder to me. I, that's not just child neglect or child abuse. That is, it's so serious. Um, but they don't, that's apparently not something they can charge them with. The grand jury indicted hubby, uh, 38 counts of child abuse, two counts of first degree kidnapping, one count of sex trafficking, and one, and one count of living off the earnings of a prostitute. Wait, wait, wait I haven't read this part of it yet. So, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> it's illegal to live off the earnings of a prostitute? What? Now, is it, are they saying he's, 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 he's her pimp? Is that, is Stamper her, the prostitute? Stamper is identified as a victim in the sex trafficking case. The woman's 33 years old, is married to the dude. Okay, so he's, so she's prostituting for her husband. He's taking her money because he's, uh, he's a pimp. All right, because he doesn't make enough money on his crappy, crappy, uh, <laughs> oh my God, on his um rap career they also had one child together and also stamper gave birth to another child last december none of the children were att attending school it was all about her and it was never about the children bingo whoever said that uh doss had access to a vehicle and the opportunity to leave home and call police or protect uh child protective services Wait a minute, Doss, wait a minute. He's the, I thought he was the, okay, Stamper's, let's see about this. Okay, Stamper's attorney said she should get probation. Get out of here. And reiterated that she was abused by Doth both physically and mentally. Very clearly, she was not thinking rationally. I think this is a misprint in this thing. Renetti pointed out that I think it's, um, Stamper had access to a vehicle, had the opportunity to leave the home and call police or child protective services. Doss had even texted Stamper a photo of one of the children who appeared to be dead, saying that he had killed them. The child survived. However, Stamper only called 911 after Doss had been cheating on her <laughs> and she had sent Doss nearly 100 unanswered text messages. She should get the same sentence as him. She should go to prison for the rest of her damnable life. She's not remorseful. She's a psychopath, just like her crappy husband. She could care less about those children. She watched those children be abused over and over and over again, and she didn't care. Oh, I couldn't help myself. I was scared. No, I don't even care if you were scared. I don't care. Here's the thing. If my life, if I'm afraid for my life, or I'm afraid for my child's life, my child wins. So I've heard too many too many times people said, well, the reason I just stayed with my husband who beat my child, sexually assaulted my child, was because I was scared of him. I don't care if you're scared of him. I don't care if you, you have to, you brought that child into the world, you better sacrifice your damn life for that child. You pick up that child, you jump in a vehicle, you go to a shelter, you get the hell out of there. And if your husband comes after you to kill you, so be it. You pick the sucker. So in this case, she scared. Oh, get out of here. Children are being tortured and you can't go to the police because you're scared of him. I don't care. You chose him. You prostituted for him. You let the children be abused. Unless you went to the police to save the children. I think you should go to prison for the rest of your pitiful, horrible life, along with your scumbag husband who was make he was living off of you. <laughs> God. Oh my. Mm. Okay. Comments. <laughs> living off of someone else's earnings from prostitution. I assume that he's a, he's, a, he's a pimp. But I mean, here's the thing that's kind of funny about that. On one hand, people say women have the right to prostitute and make money. And so if that's true, why can't she be like the the the, the bread, breadwinner in the house and the husband be the, the homemaker, you know? Why can't that be true? Why can't he live off her money? I don't see the problem there. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, yes, Linda, thank you. Absolutely premeditated, attempted murder. Just And the, these children, for the rest of their lives, they have a life sentence. All these children have a life sentence growing, having been through that with a 
horrifying mother, a father with a horrifying stepmother. And then she's got two more kids. God knows what happens to those, those children. She should never get out of prison. Um, she's given those children a life sentence. And so has he. And once you give children a life sentence, I think you ought to get a life sentence too. Um, <laughs> they, oh, that, that people always think that do we, we should have a license to have children, you know, it, it's the human condition. I mean, that children get, it's a crapshoot coming into the world as, as children. And you, you know, sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. I was pretty lucky. I think my kids were pretty lucky. Don't, don't call, don't call in kids and say you weren't, you know? but you know, and some kids are very unlucky. Um, it just sucks. It sucks. You're right. I wish there was, wish there was a way to do that, but of course there isn't. Uh, uh, I can, um, I can Google. What's the name of the case? Are you, are, are we talking about this case? Oh, you, what you missed. Um, you, yeah. What you missed is, let me tell you what the name of it is. So you can check in on it. The woman's name is Amanda Stamper. Amanda Stamper just came out, just came out that she's just went to court. So Amanda Stamper. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, that's who that case was about. You can always, you know, if you're here late, cause you know, you could, everybody has a life and you don't always, even if you're a patron, you don't always get to, uh, uh the hangouts or, or my show, the live shows on, on time. It's okay. You get to go back and watch the show again. <laughs> and by the way, if you join Patreon, you get to see the show before it becomes public. So that's kind of an advantage for some people. Um, yeah, is it th th those two cases? I tell you. Um, let's see. I've got only a few minutes left, and let me see. I, I I think I postponed this one from last week, and I want to talk about it because it's an old case, and but it's fascinating. This guy I can't pronounce his name for God's sakes. Um, Xavier Dupont de Ligonnet. <laughs> I, I'm going to make it sound like a French accent because it's supposed to be, he's French. <laughs> doesn't mean I can pronounce French. Okay. Give me Spanish. Give me Hindi, but don't give me French. Um, uh, okay. I want to, the reason I want to talk about this, I'll be, this is going to be the last 10 minutes of the show, but it's fascinating because people say, do you think he killed himself or do you think he's out there? All right. Tell you who this guy is. Let me show you his picture again. There he is. Um, this guy is known as, something that I can't pronounce. Okay. He is involved in the murders of five members of the same family in Nantes, L L L um, I can't pronounce, someplace in France. Um, his wife, Agnes Dupont de Ligonne, <laughs> and their four children, Arthur, Thomas, and, well, those are easy, and ben Benoit, uh, along with the family's two dogs, were killed on an undetermined day in early April 2011. Their bodies were found buried in their garden on April 21st. So in the beginning of April, they got killed on different days. And then their bodies were all found in the garden. Xavier disappeared at the same time and has not been found. The exact nature of the events has never been determined, but he's been they've been looking for him. An international arrest warrant has been out there and he's a prime suspect. Well, there's a good reason. He's, a, he's the only suspect. Okay. They were an old aristocratic family. La, da, 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 da. Xavier's professional activities were very vague, but he was described as a salesman by a source close to the inquiry. He created several businesses with limited success, uh, most of which catered to traveling salespeople and restaurant uh, uh, guests, blah, blah, blah. Um, he, doesn't, he didn't do that well, let's put it that way. Did he marry money? Because um, he, he wasn't that good a businessman. At the time of his murder, of, of the murders, Xavier and Agnes lived at 55 Boulevard, Robert Schumann in this town, Nantes, Lor Atlantic, or something like that, in a modest house. All right. Uh, so he's got all these children. I'm not going to go through all the children and all what they did. However, here's the timeline, which is fascinating. The lease on the house was terminated. All bank accounts were closed. The children's school received a final payment settlement. So he was closing out. Then this was done by him. He was closing out everything. Xavier phoned Agnes's employer to inform them that she was suffering from gastroenteritis. Two days later, the employer received a text saying Agnes had been hospitalized and couldn't be contacted by phone. 
The following week, the employer received a letter from Agnes terminating her employment and explaining she was following her husband to the United States. So he's closing everything down and she was working and he's make sure that they weren't looking for her. A message was placed on their letterbox said, return all mail to sender as if they had moved. The house was partially emptied. <laughs> now you wonder, why would Xavier do all this? Well, probably because he bought cement, a shovel, and a hoe. <laughs> hmm. Okay, but that was the final thing. But in March, he also purchased rifle bullets. And then he went to the shooting range when he visited it to practice his rifle techniques to learn how to shoot. A sales receipt from a DIY store was found at the family home. Okay, uh, let's see. What did he buy? A roll of large bin liners and a box of adhesive plastic paving slabs. <laughs> this is, I'm sure, for the garden. Okay, then on April 1st, the oldest child was leaving for college, but he doesn't show up at the pizzeria. Oh, he leaves college, but he doesn't show up at the pizzeria where he worked. He didn't show up. And the next day, on April 2nd, Xavier buys four bags of lime from different shops because he didn't want to be seen buying too much lime at one place. <laughs> then on the third, the neighbor sees him putting large bags into his car. The couple and three of the children dine in a restaurant. So I don't, so he's with the kids now and his wife dining at the re a restaurant and going to the theater, to the cinema. And then he, that night, he, he leaves a message, says, we spent our Sunday evening in the cinema together and then in a restaurant and now we've just gotten back. So he's trying to show how, you know, the family's happy, right? And then blah, 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 okay. But the next day, Anne and Benoit do not turn up at their school. Their friends become concerned. But there's a rumor that the family's going to Australia where their father had been given a job transfer. I guess not the US now, now it's, now, now it's Australia. They found it suspicious. Anyway, Xavier speaks with his sister and she said everything seemed normal. And then he goes with his son Thomas to a high-end restaurant, have this lovely food, uh, sea bass, tomato juice, all these things are important, and a half a bottle of some fine red wine. Total of the bill came to um, 72 euros. The two waiters remember Thomas feeling unwell near the end of the meal and they hardly ever spoke. They believe that, the investigators believe that Xavier murdered his wife and three of his children on the night of the 3rd to the 4th of April, and then murdered his son Thomas on the 5th. I'm not sure how he kept the information from one to another. But anyway, on the 5th of April, a bailiff comes to the door to recover some debt. No one answers. Uh, and then it said here, let's see, da, 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 um, some more explanations here. Um, people are looking for them. The dog. Oh, and she goes. One, the girlfriend of one of the sons goes and knocks, and the la two Labradors don't bark because <laughs> they under they aren't in the garden too. You know. Um, then Xavier on the seventh, uh, Xavier is seen large putting some bags in his car. Um, then on Friday the eighth, he goes online. And he sends a, a oh, so he goes. He sends an email to his brother saying, "You'll hear detailed information from me soon. Everything's fine." And um, then, where is the thing he says that he's in a witness protection program? Somewhere along there, he says he's in a witness protection program. And uh, it's, he he tells somebody that I can't remember when he gets his money out of his account uh, bank. He's running around someplace. They find the, the, the victims were drugged when they found the bodies. They found that the victims were drugged and shot dead with a 22 long rifle, the kind that he bought. Um, and they all, uh, let's see. And then let's see, they had some funerals. Now they're hunting for this guy and they can't find him any place. And um, everything comes into a dead end. They just don't know where he is. Um, let's see. Uh, he also had. He had helped in his previous life of, before he shot his family to death. Uh, he helped his clients open foreign bank accounts and obtain anonymous bank cards. So I'm pretty sure he knows how to move around. What are the investigators' conclusions? Uh, they have not reconsidered him as a suspect. In other words, he, he killed his family. There's no question about that. He got rid of anything, everything to do with the family. Um, and he leans toward the belief he committed suicide. I do not believe the guy committed suicide. So this is where I differ. This guy 
did too much work to then commit suicide. If he was going to kill, just shoot all the people in the family and shoot himself, he'd be done. There's a lot of family annihilators who do just that. They kill everybody and then they kill themselves or they kill everybody and then they pretend, oh, look, I came home and everybody was dead on the floor. But once you've killed everybody, buried them, killed your dogs, closed everything out, he's doing the work of moving on. It does not look like to me after all that, he's going to say, oh, now I'm just going to kill myself. No, he wanted his fresh new life. Get rid of the family, get rid of the kids. Even the dogs are a pain in the butt. Just get rid of them, get rid of everything. And I believe he is out there somewhere in the world because he's a slick little character. Uh, and he probably figured out a way to go to go missing and live his free life. Probably got a girlfriend out there someplace. I don't believe for a minute that he committed suicide. Not for a minute. Um, oh, oh, you remember? Okay. Oh, uh, I remember this case. Happened in the town my best friend lived in. Oh, really? You can probably pronounce that town, town's name better than me. Crazy case, but he definitely murdered him. It's, it's unquestionable he killed them all. There's just no question. I mean, look at all the behaviors prior to the crime and after the crime. He killed them all. The real question isn't that who that he did it or didn't do it. The real question is, did he commit suicide or is he out there in the world? And uh, let's see, when did he go missing? Um, so... Um, they've never, they've never found any evidence that he's dead. They thought he was in a monastery. They thought he was at a campsite. Um, they arrested some guy at the Glasgow airport, turned out not to be him. Challenges to the official theory. Let me check this out. Uh, oh, her brother wrote two friends. What? Wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this? Oh, his sister thinks he's innocent, <laughs> like Scott Peterson's uh, sister-in-law. Um, she began stating to the media that basically Xavier and his family left for the United States because their safety was threatened in France. The bodies found under the patio can't be those of Agnes and the children. We just found a whole bunch of other bodies to put under the patio. <laughs> She believes that the information leaked to the media originates from sources with an interest in making the family disappear. So you see, people helped him disappear by giving him a whole family of bodies that all matched his family and 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 two dead dogs. Like maybe, no, maybe they killed the dogs. Um, in a blog she created with her husband, she mentions an email that her brother wrote to two friends in 2010. He wrote of accidents which may befall his family and ended with the words, so I hope that even after a police investigation, my parents, brothers, and sisters will never be led to believe that I intentionally caused these accidents, even if the evidence is strong. <laughs> his sister's an idiot. I'm sorry, sister. You're, you're, come on now. Come on now. Mm -mm -mm. Um. Let's see. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just pretty funny. You can find all this on Wikipedia. It's just it's just funny as heck. Um, and of course, 900 people have believed they've seen him. I don't know. Who knows what that means? Uh, five documentaries have been made about the case. That's fascinating. Um, I might have to I might have to do a whole maybe a real show on this one one day because just so a lot of people aren't going to see the um, they're not going to see the hangouts because that's uh, highly a patron thing and yet. Other people do come to the hangouts, but a lot of times they just see the case files, uh, the case shows. But I might have to do one just because it's, it's just humorous in a horrifying way. Just amazing. Um, hmm. um, let's say, uh, oh, uh, they, they actually had money issues, if I remember correctly. A lot of times when, when guys off their families, it's because they are running into money issues and the family becomes a massive burden. And also an embar they're embarrassed that they, they, they do are doing poorly. Um, but psychopathy comes before the money problems. So there's, you know, and a lot of times they're not doing as badly as all that. They could, they could, they could wade through it, but they know if they get rid of the family, they don't have to. Cause you know, taking care of just a, a single person, you can just run off and you can get a job and you can do other things, especially if you're a criminal, you can just, you know, make money in some other way. And you only got you, you don't have to take care of the house anymore. You don't have to feed the stupid dogs. You don't have to pay for your kids schooling. You know, you don't have to deal with any of that anymore. You're just free. That's why people kill off their families. You know, 
Unbelievable. Uh, very, very fascinating case. But anyway, that's uh, it is now nine o'clock. So I'm going to stop here. Um, so I'm glad you all were here. Again, if you're new to the channel, please do subscribe, support this educational channel. It makes a difference. Believe you me. Um, and if you're interested in any particular case, please go to the search engine at YouTube and put in profiler Pat Brown and the case you're interested in and see if I've done it. Otherwise, just check all the playlists. I got lots and lots of cases there. Um, so anyway, thank you guys for being here as usual. Always make it fun for me because I, you know, talking to just a camera is not that fun. And although I occasionally do videos uh, without being a, no, without a live audience, I always enjoy lives a lot more. It's just, it makes doing YouTube much more fun because if I only did videos, I probably wouldn't do YouTube. It's just, you know, not, not so thrilling, but some, some, some videos I do just because it's not worth, it's not a whole show and I want to talk about a specific topic. So I do those videos when uh, there's something right focused. I want, just want to focus in on one particular issue. So, but anyway, thank you all for being here. Good night, Clarissa. Good night, Sky Ricky. <laughs> Most welcome, Jill. So goodbye, everybody who's here. I, the, yeah, these were most of these are recommended to me. Some of them I find on my own um, because I check the news. Uh, some things I check back on, but a lot of them come from you guys because um, believe me, I can't research everything that's out there. And so when you tell me things, uh, cases to look at, that's how I find out about them. Um, so this weekend, um, if you're if you're here live, um, I'll be doing uh, the Vanishing Triangle out of Ireland. Um, there's a couple different places, a few different places you can get information on that. There's a fictionalized version of it, which I'm not so sure is very good. Uh, and there's another one put up by Sky, um, and you have to pay for it. So there's two, two uh, episodes of a documentary, which is supposed to be pretty good, but you can also go on YouTube. So I'll be sending out that information on the show for Sunday on the Vanishing Triangle, where young women disappear and are never seen again. Uh, is are they connected or are they not connected? So we'll be looking at all of that. So anyway, <laughs> thank you for being here. And I will see you guys if you're coming back on Sunday. See you then. Bye.